Something that you've noticed is that um, most civil and functioning societies throughout history have shared the common themes of justice, love, spirituality, beauty, freedom, truth, and power. Why do you think that is? Well, the short answer as a theologian is because we are all made in the image of God. And though many, many people would either deny that entirely or would seek to redirect it in different ways, I would say that deep down inside all human beings, unless for whatever reason they've been quite seriously kind of emotionally or morally damaged, but virtually all human beings and certainly all societies know in their bones that actually it's a good thing to do justice, to keep the world in balance. Um, It's a good thing to celebrate and cherish beauty and to uh, seek more of it. It's a wonderful thing to be free oneself and to enable others to have freedom, even though historically that's often been purchased at the cost of people's slavery, etc. So in, in all these cases, I would track it back to a fundamental Jewish and Christian belief about what human beings are. Of course, different philosophers would do that differently, but they would then have to give an answer themselves as to why it is that humans seem to want all these things and to feel drawn to them. And I suppose some reductionists might say these are kind of uh, urges that come from an earlier stage in our evolution when we needed to do certain things when we were hunter-gatherers or whatever. I would say, well, that itself was a symptom of the much larger and deeper thing, which is that we are all made in the image of the creator God, and that we know that the world ought to be uh, what it would be if everyone was doing these things and doing them properly and thoroughly. Yes, you know, and, and I think that's so interesting. That's definitely how I see the world. But you know, one of the interesting points you make in your book is that these signposts of justice, love, spirituality, beauty, freedom, they are present because we are created in God's image because there is a world that he has designed and wants to come to pass, but they are broken while we are here in this world. Can you talk to us about why you call them broken signposts? Yes, yes. I mean, this is the paradox. And I actually started this sequence of thought um, some years ago when I wrote a book, which I know you have read, uh, called Simply Christian. Um, And the publishers asked me when I wrote that book, which is in 2005, I think, to try to do something like C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity for the 21st century. And I reread Mere Christianity after many years, and I was struck by the fact that Lewis begins with justice. He begins by saying, you don't have to teach children in the playground that there is such a thing as fairness. That's not fair, they say to one another. And they know that uh, justice is important, but that we all mess it up. And and Lewis begins with that, and I decided I would begin with that as well, because it seems a totally fair point. I I then diverged from Lewis by bringing in these other themes, and in Simply Christian, as you know, I brought in uh, spirituality, relationships, and beauty, and now I've added three more, freedom, truth, and power. And the point is, it's a paradox. We all know these things matter. We know that love, flourishing, functioning, supportive human relationships, what could be more important than that? And yet we all know that in our friendships, in our marriages, in our families, in our um, international relations, we mess it up. We don't trust each other. We are selfish. We don't say sorry when we should, etc., etc. And so there's a paradox. We all know it's important. So why can't we get on and do it? And so these things which look like signposts, justice and beauty and so on, look as if they're pointing us to the real meaning of human life. And perhaps even if there is a God to the real God. But the signposts are all broken, which leads some philosophers and sociologists to say, there you are, the whole thing's just a sick joke. We've got these impulses, but they don't actually mean anything because they don't amount to a hill of beans. uh, We we, we just mess them all up anyway. So why even bother reflecting on them? And that's where I think the idea that they really are signposts, but that they really are broken, paradoxically opens the door to the next things that the book goes on to say. Yes. And, you know, you said and you mentioned in the book that those broken signposts point to the story of Jesus and what we need in that story of Jesus, actually, where we can find signposts, the the truth of those signposts and hold on to it. And, you know, some of the points that you make are so interesting. You know, you talk about, um, you know, love and and when we do, we love something too much. Um, We we distort love, we pervert love, but the love that God offers us through Jesus is an altogether solid and different kind of love. Can you tell us a bit about that? 
Well, yes. I mean, for me, the insight came and I, it's one of those things, sometimes when you're working on a project, you wrestle with issues for months and then suddenly when you're thinking about something else, it all goes click. I'm both delighted and slightly ashamed to say that this particular insight came to me one day was up when I was on the golf course. And I think that's because my mind had been joggled around in different directions. But the insight was this, that when you think about justice, spirituality, relationships, beauty, freedom, truth and power, then you think about the story of Jesus as he goes to his death. It isn't just a matter of, oh, well, Jesus offers us this. That story itself is a story about justice being denied, about freedom, the freedom of the Jewish people being trampled on by the Romans, about power being abused, about relationships and love being spurned as one of Jesus' followers betrays him and another one denies him and they all run away. And spirituality, the sense of the presence of God, even that seems to go dark when Jesus shouts out, my God, why did you abandon me? And I suddenly realized that we might have thought that the signposts are all pointing up to a God who is maybe a bit distant, but perhaps he's there somewhere. But instead, what we find is that the story of Jesus is the story of the God who comes to the place where the signposts are all broken to the place where justice is denied, where love is spurned, where beauty turns horrible, et cetera, et cetera. And that seems to me is the heart of why it is that the cross, even the symbol of the cross or the gesture of the cross is so powerful, even sort of pre-intuitively that people just know in their bones that this means something powerful, even if they couldn't explain why. And I think we have the answer here because that story says you don't have to stretch up to God. God has come down to the place, not where you are at your best, but where we are at our worst and at our most vulnerable and so on. And that is the story of the love of God, which then supremely comes through in John's gospel, which of course I do a lot with in the book. And I really love that you've based that book throughout, you know, um, John's gospel is woven throughout Broken Signpost, it's very powerful. You know, one of the things that stood out to me was the theme of beauty in the book, that beauty still surrounds us, but the world can be such a dark place. And you make a comment that, you know, the resurrection of Jesus in particular um, is where it can be made sense of, a world that is both brutal and beautiful. Can you speak more to that? Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean... I have loved beauty, art, music, landscapes, etc. since I was quite small. I've always just been drawn to beauty in all sorts of forms. Um, but it's puzzled me for a long time that the Bible very seldom uses the word beauty. There are a few places, but not that many. Um, and then I realized not that long ago that this is because the Bible does what they teach you in writing school that you should do. That if you're writing a novel, you don't say it was a beautiful sight. You describe the sight so that the reader feels, wow, that's beautiful. Because if you just tell them it was a beautiful sight, oh, well, you know, I wish I could see it, but I can't. And, and the Bible describes things in such a way that we the readers are led to a sort of sense of awe and wonder and this for me comes at one particular moment in John's gospel namely chapter 20 when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb while it is still dark and she wonders what's going on and then the tomb is empty and then she's weeping and then finally Jesus meets her and there they are in this garden and now the sun has risen and they address one another in Aramaic and so on and that sense of the freshness of the new creation, which John has woven into that, it, it, that scene is is worth, you know, all the great paintings in the world. Um, so John doesn't say, what a beautiful sight. Of course he doesn't, that would be to trivialize it. But we, the readers, if we're awake, if our imaginations are kindled, we ought to be saying, wow, this is new creation and it is beautiful and we just should be grateful for it. So all the way through John's Gospel, we see hints of that, but I think it's in chapter 20 that it really comes out. Yes, and we, you know, when you talk about new creation throughout the book, and we're talking here about the possibilities of what God has created this world to be, right, without sin and death, and so that new creation, that the resurrection of Jesus ushers in, calls those who follow Jesus to be a new creation people. 
What does it look like to be a new creation person? Well, uh, th that's one of the many exciting things uh, about John's gospel, that right from the beginning, from the prologue, John says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, which is an ancient phrase, sons of God or children of God, which the people of Israel believed was applied specially to them. And it's as though Jesus has summed up uh, the whole vocation of Israel in himself, so that now anyone, Jew or Gentile, from any background at all, can be part of this kind of extended family. And then the whole point of that family, the family of Israel, as we know from the scriptures of Israel, what Christians have called the Old Testament, um, is that Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations, was supposed to be the people who were following in God's way and doing justice and loving mercy and walking humbly with God. And again and again, that too became a broken signpost that the people of Israel were striving after that, but they kept on missing it, as, as the best of them regularly confess in the scriptures and in subsequent Jewish literature. But here in the New Testament, Jesus is saying, you are the light of the world, and if you follow me, we can be that together. So that Jesus, by what he uniquely does, then breathes his spirit on his followers and says, basically, now you are to be for the world what I have been uniquely for Israel. So you are to be people of justice, of beauty, of freedom, of truth, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it's because of Jesus' spirit breathed upon us that we can begin to be people like that. And that actually historically, I mean, for the last 200 years, the Western world has tended to say that Christianity is part of the problem, not part of the solution. But that is simply um, 18th century rhetoric and smokescreen, because in fact, the gospel of Jesus lived out by his followers, even you know, when their very humdrum, ordinary existence uh, people that gospel lived out in that way has actually changed the world, has given the vision of truth and beauty and freedom and power to God's people and to the world in a whole new way. And, and so it, it's, it's through the achievement of Jesus on the cross, dealing with the powers of darkness that have held us back, and then as a result, able to launch new creation and to breathe that new creation by the Spirit into the lungs and the moral and uh, and, and spiritual capacities of his followers. But that, that's the basic dynamic. <laughs>